at home, it looks like they've lost the war in Ukraine. In order to deflect attention from that, there needs to be something else uh, for the Russian viewers at home to watch, and I think that that's Syria. Hi everybody, I'm Simon Ostrovsky, a reporter for Vice News, and today I'm hosting On The Line. We're talking about Russia, and Russia has been in the news this week because they started bombing a new country, Syria. And it's actually the first time uh, that Russia has used its military outside of the former Soviet Union since the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union. Uh, so a lot of people have had questions about uh, what Russia's intentions are, uh, where the Ukraine war is at, uh, and what might be happening in the near future, and I'm going to try to answer those questions um, as best I can. We've got some callers here, and uh, Michael Hopper, our producer, is going to introduce them and uh, send me those questions over. Hey, yeah, Simon, thank you for coming on. Uh, I know you've been on a, four times now. We're excited to have you back. So uh, let's get started and, and say hello to our first caller, uh, and that's Vukashin. Uh, hey, Simon. Uh, Mukashin here. I have uh, two questions for you. Uh, first one, do you think that Russia is trying to shift world's attention from frozen conflict in Ukraine by intervening in Syria? Or is it a push uh, towards a new uh, world of which Putin spoke in the UN? And my second question is, do you think that their approach will be somehow radically different than the United States-led uh, coalition's approach? Thank you. Well, uh, Vukashin, I think uh, that uh, for the question about their approach in Syria, whether it's going to be different, it is a yes and no answer. Because um, on the one hand, they're using the same uh, tactics as the, the uh, international coalition that's included Britain and France and the United States, which is they soften up a target uh, by bombing it relentlessly for a while, and then forces on the ground that are allied to the Western powers, rebels that are funded by them or um, supported by them, uh, then go in and uh, finish up the job. So in that sense, uh, Russia's uh, operating system is exactly the same. The difference, though, is that their targets are different, A, and B, um, they can't fly in from another country because they don't have the, the same ability to project power. So if uh, Western militaries can, say, fly their planes out of bases in neighboring countries or off of uh, aircraft carriers, the Russians have had to actually build an uh, airfield from scratch inside uh, Syria on territory controlled by the regime. Um, and bring all of their equipment uh, into the country because they don't have the aircraft carriers and they don't have the bases in the neighboring countries, and which is why they have had to work uh, very closely in cooperation with the uh, Syrian government there. Um, the uh, Russians have declared that they are getting involved because of uh, ISIS and that they want to fight the Islamic State. And we've actually got uh, a clip from uh, Vladimir Putin talking about uh, the danger that the Islamic State poses. So let's have a look at that clip real quick before we uh, answer the rest of this question. Especially given that Islamic State camps train militants from many countries, including the European countries. Unfortunately, dear colleagues, I have to put it frankly, Russia is not an exception. We cannot allow these criminals who have already tasted blood to return back home and continue their evil doings. No one wants this to happen, does he? So right there you heard Putin say that uh, uh, ISIS poses a grave threat to the entire world and that there are a lot of Russian citizens, um, uh, predominantly from the Muslim parts of Russia, fighting on the side of Islamic State. Uh, that's been their rationale, but their rationale, or at least their stated rationale, has been put into question by U.S. officials. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal today that quoted U.S. officials uh, who said that they weren't striking ISIS at all, that the uh, first uh, attacks um, were against um, groups that have been funded by the CIA, the so-called moderate opposition forces to the Assad regime. So it seems like their actual strategy is to do anything they can to support uh, the Assad regime, not necessarily to fight ISIS. Um, 
So I think that's uh, very telling, you know, of the way that Russia does uh, business around the world, the geopolitics of uh, how they operate, what they say on the one hand and what they, what they do on the other. Uh, your other question, I think, was about Ukraine. Now, we've seen, I just came back from Ukraine, yes. and uh, I was in the Lugansk region in the area controlled by the Lugansk People's Republic. And I can confirm that it's a lot quieter there, and while I was there for about five days, uh, I didn't hear a single shot fired or an explosion or an art artillery come down anywhere. Basically, the ceasefire is holding, and we've started to hear things uh, from the separatist leadership as well as the leadership of Russia that we haven't been hearing before. And it seems like they very much want to at least temporarily put Ukraine behind them so that they can focus on other things. And there might be a few different explanations for, for that, um, but I'd like you to hear uh, an interview that I did with uh, the Lugansk People's Republic's uh, negotiator in Minsk. And Minsk is the place where um, the separatists, Ukraine, uh, Russia, have been holding negotiations. I mean, you know about it, but perhaps some of our other viewers don't. For over a year, and there's supposedly been a ceasefire uh, agreed in Minsk, uh, which hasn't held up until now. And it was very surprising to me, having done this interview, to hear a representative of the Lugansk People's Republic uh, talk about uh, his area under their control uh, remaining, at least officially, as a part of Ukraine. That's the kind of language that those sort of officials haven't been using in the past. So let's uh, hear what he had to say to me. Ну, на сегодня у нас достигнуто достаточно хрупкое, но все-таки прекращение огня. У меня есть надежда, что мы уже прошли этот конец войны, что у нас последнее серьезное столкновение уже позади. Как вы видите статус э, Луганской и Донецкой Народной Республики? Они остаются формально в составе Украины? Пока идет сотрудничество с Украиной. Если Украина в состоянии перейти к этапу сотрудничества с республиками, so there you have it. Um, you know, one of their officials talking about remaining within Ukraine, and I think these are orders that have come down directly from Moscow, because in the other rebel region, Donetsk People's Republic, we've seen some of the uh, more hawkish leaders get sidelined and lose their positions, and the more um, pliable uh, sort of guys who are ready to negotiate, they've been promoted. Um, and uh, I think that this is this Russia's pivot away from Ukraine towards Syria. And I think there are, you know, broader reasons for why that's happening. First of all, the Ukraine crisis has uh, led to Russia's isolation and sanctions against Russia, uh, which have uh, really hurt the Russian economy because not only are the sanctions going on, but the price of oil has fallen, which is Russia's main export. So Russia's been hit hard economically. and. The only way that they could hope to ever see the sanctions get lifted is if the Minsk agreement is implemented. At least that's what the United States and the Europeans have said. So I think Russia right now is pushing uh, for Minsk to happen. Um, at the same time, the, the problem with that approach for Russia is that at home, it looks like they've lost the war in Ukraine. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily think that that's true. But that's what it looks like to the people at home. So what was this war for? Oh, why did all these people die if this part of Ukraine isn't even going to be joined to Russia? In order to deflect attention from that, there needs to be something else uh, for the Russian viewers at home to watch. And I think that that's Syria. Uh, and we've seen, if you watch the Russian news these days, that uh, literally, like sort of in a, in a, in a matter of a week, um, the faucet of Ukraine information has been turned off and the faucet of Syria information uh, has been turned on full throttle. And, and so now all of the airwaves in Russia are just talking about Syria. And it allows Vladimir Putin to also show that he's an important actor on the international stage. Great, thank you. All right, thank you, Vikashan. Really appreciate you coming on. Uh, so Simon, before we get to another caller on Skype, we've got a lot of people on Twitter who are asking you questions, uh, including Johan, who wants to know, uh, what do you think the chances are of Russia wanting to protect Russians in other European countries in the future? And uh, similar to that, we got Benjamin who wants to know uh, if you think Russia is going to make a military movement against the Baltic states, maybe something similar to like what we saw in Crimea. What are your thoughts about that? 
I think a military move against the Baltic states would be very unadvisable for Russia. I mean, a military move against any state is unadvisable for Russia, but you know, Russia's been able to handle it so far. Um, the Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, are fully fledged members of NATO. NATO has a clause in its agreement called Article 5, which basically states that an attack on any member of NATO is an attack on all the members of NATO. So an attack on Estonia would uh, equal uh, an attack on the United States and Britain and France and all the rest of the uh, NATO members. Um, I, I don't think Russia is uh, interested in that kind of a confrontation. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't really see that that's happening on the cards at all. All right. So I hope that answers those questions, guys. Uh, tweet, us, tweet at us if it doesn't, and maybe Simon will answer it later. But, uh, you know, until then, why don't we say hey to Ethan, uh, who's calling us on Skype. Hey, Ethan. Hey, hey Simon. Uh, I have two questions. My first one uh, is looking at the big picture, uh, how will um, increased Russian support uh, in Syria affect the Middle Eastern region in the long run? I think it's really too early to say exactly how all of this is going to play out. Uh, a lot of people have been drawing the comparison to the Soviet Union's uh, uh, involvement in Afghanistan, and uh, which to some extent led to uh, overreach and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, but I think it's way too early to make that kind of a comparison because uh, the Russians are talking about uh, strictly an air campaign. Now they're on the ground a little bit because they've had to set up that airfield in Syria uh, and they've got uh, you know forces there, maybe 500 or 1,000 or maybe even up to a couple of thousand soldiers at that uh, airfield to protect the airfield. But that's not a ground invasion. That's uh, simply um, securing the, the, the area that they're operating from. Um, Afghanistan was a, a, a huge, huge ground war. Uh, and Syria is nowhere near that scale for Russia uh, at the moment. Um, so I guess, you know, today is the second day of Russian bombing runs. Uh, what kind of effect it's going to have, uh, only time will tell. But um, uh, Sergei Ivanov, uh, who used to be the Russian defense minister and is currently the, uh, Putin's chief of staff, um, came out and, and spoke about Russia's aims in, in Syria, so we can have a listen uh, to hear what he had to say. Речь идет исключительно об операции военно-воздушных сил Российской Федерации. Как уже говорил наш президент, использование вооруженных сил на сухопутном театре военных действий исключено. И военной целью операции является исключительно воздушная поддержка сирийских правительственных сил в их противодействии ИГИЛу. So again, we hear um, Sergei Ivanov talking about uh, support for the government forces in Syria uh, in their fight against Islamic State. Uh, but already it seems that those goals have been shown to be not the only goals because uh, Russia has been bombing other targets besides Islamic State. And if you watch uh, the news, it's really interesting, in Russia in particular, they show those maps that we've all seen on the internet and on Twitter and on the news of these uh, uh, different patchwork of colors of who controls what in Syria and sort of on the eastern side it's mostly Islamic State and then on on the western side it's mostly the regime and then on the northern side it's uh, rebel forces uh, that are against the regime you know and, and, and pockets of all of those mixed in throughout. On the Russian news the picture is very different. It just says everything except for the Assad regime is Islamic State. That's the Russian view that they're trying to get um, the Russian population to believe in, uh, which for them justifies bombing absolutely anyone, including the forces uh, that are allied with the Western countries. Okay. Um, my second question is, uh, I, I recently saw Dispatch 110, of your Russian roulette series, about how the Minsk agreement is starting to actually work. Um, now, as recently as August 11th of this year, um, the, New, the New York Times had a story on how the governments of uh, the diplomats from the Russian government, the United States, and some Middle Eastern nations were uh, having meetings 
about uh, maybe a resolution to the situation in Syria. Um, since uh, Russia is working more diplomatically with Ukraine, do you think anything like that could happen in Syria, or is there military action taking in the past uh, week uh, kind of preventing that from occurring at this time? Well, if you'd asked me a week ago, uh, I would have said one of the reasons that uh, Russia is getting involved in Syria is to fix its image in the West and to show that it can not be a spoiler all the time and that it can cooperate with the rest of the world because the sanctions are biting and they want to show that they can uh, you know, be of some value and uh, not just cause, cause problems. Um, but with the reports that we've got from the last couple of days of uh, them bombing targets, which aren't necessarily ISIS targets, and our rebels that are allied with the United States, it's hard to see how uh, ne negotiations with the other countries involved in Syria uh, could be successful. You know, I mean, we're still, we're still trying to figure out what's going on there, and it's all such a haze right now, it's going to take a while for the smoke to settle uh, to really understand what Russia's intentions are over there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Ethan, thank you for coming on. And uh, Simon, <laughs> as you can imagine, we're getting a lot of tweets. And I want you to take a look at this one from Chris. Okay. Uh, Chris wants to know, uh, what do you think the chances are that Russia and, uh, Russian, excuse me, and coalition uh, fighter jets might bump into each other in Syria? And what might happen if, if uh, an unfortunate incident were to occur? Well, they're not coordinating, so you know that's a real risk, and that could be a real problem. Uh, we don't want United States Air Force and Russian Air Force going head to head, because that's one of those little situations that could grow into something called World War III. So uh, it's a huge problem that uh, the United States and Russia aren't coordinating right now. I think they realize that here in the United States, and they definitely realize that in Russia, and perhaps that's part of the thinking, is that you don't want to engage with us but the risks are huge here, so you're going to have to engage with, uh, with us, and that means we're going to get invited to all the big boy meetings where things get decided, whether you like it or not. So that might be what we see happening um, a little bit further down the line. Because the only alternative to that would be to give uh, the rebels supported by the U.S. and the West uh, sophisticated anti-aircraft shoulder launchers that they could use to shoot down Russian aircraft. Uh, the problem with that strategy is that those weapons could then fall into uh, the hands of more unsavory uh, rebels like ISIS uh, in Syria and be used against American or British warplanes. So I don't, I don't see that um, that's a strategy that the Western powers are going to go down. All right. Well, I hope that answered your question, Chris. Um, and speaking of questions, I know we've got Robert uh, on Skype who wants to ask you even more questions, Simon. So let's say hey to Robert. Hey, Simon. How's it going? Hey, Robert. Um, given... Uh, that the U.S.-led coalition has been at it for a, over a year with little to show, not little to show, but they've made some gains with the help of the Kurds and uh, some of the, uh, the Iraqi army. Do you think eventually the Russians themselves, uh, the soldiers, would get involved on the ground? Not just like advisory roles like you mentioned earlier, but soldiers themselves fighting alongside the uh, Syrian army? Well, nothing the Russians have been saying so far uh, with their mouths have indicated that that's a possibility. Uh, and to be honest, nothing that they've been doing on the ground so far has indicated that that's a possibility either, uh, because they've uh, moved a very limited amount of soldiers in. So whether that's going to happen in the future is, uh, you know, not something that I can really say off the top of my head. Um, but then again, you know, once you get involved in a war, uh, it it sort of foments its own logic. So a bit further down the line, decisions that seem really far-fetched and irrational right now uh, might seem to make uh, more sense to the people who are invested, become invested in the war, um, and are only just starting to get involved in the war now. So anything's a possibility. I think, though, that if that did happen, then it would be really stretching the um, country's resources, and it would probably be a pretty big mistake uh, for Russia, because it would be turning something that right now is pretty much intended uh, as a public relations campaign for the audience back home uh, into something a lot more significant that involves lots of uh, bodies coming back home and could lead to other social 
uh, problems in Russia, and I think that's the last thing that Putin wants. Okay, and um, I had another question, which again you touched upon earlier. Do you see the Russian Air Force openly uh, bombing uh, the FSA and groups that are not ISIS, like Al Qaeda, as well? Um, do you foresee that having unintended consequences, such as increased arms being flowed to uh, vetted groups, maybe not man pads, but anti tank anti tank missiles or heavier arms and things like that, which will give make it harder for the Syrian army? to take back that land? I'm not sure what your question is. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, if the Russians openly bomb like groups like the U.S. has backed in the FSA. Okay, well they, uh, so you, they, it seems like they have already. Yeah. But so we've I, answered I, that I, part of the question. Yeah, um, do you think that might have an unintended consequence like get them, those groups that Russians have bombed uh, getting increased arms, like uh, more, more sophisticated anti-tank missiles? Uh, that would give the Syrian army on the ground a harder time taking back that land, because the Air Force can only do so much. Uh, the, you're going to need the army on the ground to help take back that land. Do you think the Russians bombing those groups would have an un unintended consequence like that? Well, I think you're asking me if the United States is going to give the rebels on the ground more sophistic sophisticated weaponry because suddenly their local allies down there are being bombed by Russia. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. I have no idea. I don't know. Okay. okay. All right. That's it. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, thanks, Robert, for coming on, and Simon for answering that question honestly. Uh, sometimes I don't know is the only answer. So um, I hope you know the answer to this one. Uh, this is a tweet that we just got from Nael. He wants to know, um, in what ways do Putin's interests in Syria differ from Iran's? And also, do you think Putin is aiming to create an Alawite state in Syria? I think Putin is aiming to back the Syrian government and to support Assad. And if that uh, effectively leads to the creation of an Alawite state, um, then that's what's going to happen. But I don't think he's set out as a goal, the creation of an Alawite state on its own. Um, Iran, you know, needs to continue to control a sort of northern arc in the Middle East that it had before this war started. It had a corridor all the way to Lebanon through Syria um, where it could support its uh, ally Hezbollah uh, in its fight against Israel. And the fight against Israel is really important to Iran because it's where the Iranian uh, regime draws a lot of its legitimacy from. Uh, and Iran wants to be a major regional player. Uh, and, and it can't see uh, its ally uh, Assad go under. I think uh, we've talked about uh, Putin's uh, goals uh, in Syria you know, before. And uh, his goals are slightly different, but at the end of the day, both of them uh, want to see their ally, Assad, uh, survive this war. All right. Well, now I hope that answered your question. Um, so, Simon, we've got one more person on Skype for you today. It's Dennis. So let's say hey to Dennis calling us from London. Hey, Dennis. What's up? Hi, Simon. Здравствуй. Anyways, uh, so my question is uh, more about the relationship with the U.S. and Russia. And... Uh, what effect sanctions have had so far? Uh, is it just affecting very specific groups uh, in Russia, very specific individuals, or is it affecting like the broader population? I think the broader population is affected uh, by the sanctions indirectly because in combination with the overall worsening economic situation, um, you know, the sanctions are having more bite than they would have necessarily had. But a lot of the uh, bite of the sanctions actually comes from Russia's own uh, countermeasures to the sanctions, which seem a little bit counterproductive to me, which have been to ban a lot of food products that are imported from the European Union. And uh, it's dressed up in Russia as if um, the ban on imports is actually part of the sanctions that the West has imposed against Russia. That's not actually true. Russia itself has banned uh, you know, cheeses and hams and all kinds of other things that come from the European Union. Uh, and, and that's driven uh, food prices up. Uh, so, you know, when you have the combination of the Russian ruble collapsing uh, because of lower oil prices, and then uh, food prices going up because of less competition uh, on the marketplace, um, then uh, that, at the end of the day, makes uh, ordinary Russian people uh, de facto poorer. Um, the sanctions themselves were calibrated to hit people in Putin's inner circle. 
uh, and they were also calibrated to hit uh, important industries like uh, the oil industry. Now, there's no ban on Russian oil exports as such, but there is a ban on imports of highly sophisticated technologies from the West that Russia needs in order to uh, maintain the level of production of oil that it has right now. So those particular sanctions aren't going to have an immediate effect, but any Russian planners uh, thinking about uh, how they're going to operate a couple of years down the line realize that if they're not able to get those uh, technologies that they need to do, for example, uh, Arctic drilling in very difficult conditions, um, then they're not going to be able to maintain the level uh, of oil production that they have right now, and that's going to uh, lead to bigger, bigger problems in the future. All right. Uh, my, I kind of had a second question that has to do with that, which is, uh, do you see any circumstances under which uh, the uh, uh, an end to the sanctions would be negotiated, uh, considering the fact that uh, even let's say the in Ukra Eastern Ukraine the war is dying down, uh, but Crimea still looks set to be a part of Russia, and a political solution is still a pretty distant reality. Um, so is it going to be stuck in a limbo, or uh, what do you see happening? Well, you know the, the Western countries from the beginning have been pretty clear about the uh, conditions under which the sanctions could be lifted. And uh, it's the implementation of the Minsk agreement. And the Minsk agreement, agreement requires that the, well, I mean, I think the main part of the Minsk agreement and the most difficult part of the Minsk agreement to implement is the return of the Ukrainian-Russian border to Ukrainian control in the areas where right now it's controlled by Russia and the separatists. Um, and that would essentially mean cutting off the separatist entities from Russia, from their supply base in Russia, from the military in Russia, and would pretty much spell the end of those separatist entities. So that's the biggest sort of clincher at the moment. Um, if, uh, if that doesn't happen, though, I don't think that the sanctions are going to be lifted either. Um, and they've sort of separated the issue of Crimea. So in some sense, the operation in eastern Ukraine has already been successful for Russia, no matter what happens in eastern Ukraine, um, because it's deflected successfully in from, uh, discussion over the fate of Crimea. Um, and all of the discussion has been over the fate of eastern Ukraine instead. All right, thanks. Yeah, and uh, Dennis, thank you for coming on. And Simon, this is the, the best part of the show, uh, where I thank you for coming on and uh, ask if you've got anything you want to tell our viewers at home. Yeah, speaking of Crimea, uh, I was just down by the border with Crimea in southern Ukraine, uh, and we produced a new dispatch about um, a economic blockade that uh, certain forces in Ukraine are imposing against Crimea to try to get the Russians to return that territory and to bring attention to Crimea. It's Dispatch 111, and it's going to be dropping on vicenews.com later today, so check it out. How do you think who won in this war? Do you think who won in this war? No, because the pain of peace, they are more than any other. This is all about. Вот ради них же все это делают. Ну зачем оно им это надо? Да и взорванные мосты, это все. Никто. И в этой войне победителей нет. Ну как можно победить в гражданской войне? 